everybody. Today's practice problem comes from Principles of Microeconomics by Dirk Mateer and Lee Kopik. We're going to be doing chapter 6, problem number 6. The problem begins as follows. It says, a new medical study indicates that eating blueberries helps prevent cancer. Fun fact, I think it actually does. I think blueberries are pretty high in antioxidants and stuff like that. If the demand for blueberries increases, what will happen to the size of the consumer and producer surplus? And then it's asking us to draw a diagram and to show graphically what actually happens. So the first part of this is something that we've done before. We've already done our comparative statics analysis and we think about changes in equilibrium and we know how to do that, so let's start there and then think about how to put consumer and producer surplus on that. So here we can just start with our supply and demand diagram. Again, we have market quantity on the horizontal axis, and we have price on the vertical axis. And since the problem didn't tell us otherwise, we can just start with just our typical shaped supply and demand curves. Maybe we have a supply curve that's upward sloping like this, and a demand curve that's downward sloping like this. And then coming back to the problem, it says, the demand for blueberries increases. So we know that a demand increase is a shift to the right on the quantity axis. So our shift in demand is going to look something like this here. So our new demand curve, call that D prime, is going to be something like this here. And we can label our old and our new equilibria, and that'll give us a good starting point for how to label things to be able to think about consumer and producer surplus. So here we could just say our original market quantity was this guy here called this Q1 star. And our new market quantity is this here called this Q2 star. And then we also have our market prices. So we have a P1 star, which is just the price of the original supply and demand equilibrium. And we have a P2 star, like so. So this is the first thing that we need to do. And now we need to overlay on this a way to think about the areas of consumer and producer surplus. One thing that's really helpful to do when analyzing changes in producer and consumer surplus is to draw what's called a welfare table. And our welfare table is just going to show consumer surplus, producer surplus, if there were other parties involved in this market, if there was a government, if there was an impact on everybody else, we'd add those guys in too. And then we can have columns for before and after in this case. And then we can think explicitly about the change in consumer and producer surplus. So here, we could do something like this. We could say, we're going to want a table that's going to have, you know, I'll do even total. So I'll say consumer surplus, producer surplus, and then total surplus or social surplus. And then before, after, and change. So really want, what I want is a 4 by 4 table that looks like something like this here. I could have done this when the camera wasn't on, but I think it's somewhat helpful for you to actually see the process of drawing the table, right? So I could just say before, so this would be before the demand increase in this case, after, and change, which is just going to be this minus this. And then we can think about consumer surplus producer surplus, and let's just call this total surplus. Sometimes it's called social surplus, same idea. It's just the surplus for everybody that's affected by the market. So we have this, and then we need a useful way to represent these areas. And we usually say, you know, when we're looking at this, not surprisingly, our consumer and producer surplus is going to be, you know, some triangles and other areas of that sort. So it's helpful, rather than just drawing the triangles, to have a way to specifically represent that. And oftentimes the way we do that is we put letters to represent specific areas of our diagram. And we can do that like the following. The first thing that I want to do here is make sure that my demand curves actually hit the axes so that our regions are well defined. It's not so important for them to hit the axes down here because we're not going to be calculating surplus past 
the quantity that's actually being transacted. But here it's kind of important to understand what exactly our regions entail. And the other thing that we want to do, because we want to think about how many different areas we have to have and how many different areas we have to label, and that's a little bit tricky. It takes some practice, so I encourage you to practice a little bit on your own. But in general, I would say a rule of thumb is that it's rarely problematic to have too many areas, but it can become problematic to have too few because then all of a sudden you're trying to calculate a surplus and the areas aren't divided in the way that you want them to be divided. So I would do the following. I would say, well, we started, did the first useful thing, and that was to label the relevant prices and quantities, because those are going to serve as the boundaries for our areas. It's probably also helpful to connect this up, just in case. And then we can think about what all of our areas look like. And again, this might be a little bit of overkill, but just go with me here. We could say we have an area A that's this weird looking thing that's bounded by these dotted lines. We have an area B, which is this triangle. We have an area C, which is this trapezoid. We have an area D, which is this triangle. And then we've got these little guys in here. We've got, call this E, F and G, and I can notice that this is all I'm going to have to label. So I didn't actually label everything. Notice I didn't label this area, I didn't label this area, because based on what we know about consumer and producer surplus, I can see that even after the increase in demand, my total surplus is just going to be this big triangle here. So I didn't really need to label anything outside of that triangle. And that's cheating a little bit, but again, if you label too many things, it's not really going to be harmful. So we can think about the before scenario and say, well, before, when the demand curve was here at D, let's think about consumer surplus. And we say consumer surplus is everything above the relevant price for the consumer, which in this case is just P1 star, below the demand curve, to the left of the equilibrium quantity that's being transacted. So in this case, the, in the old scenario, our consumer surplus is B plus C. Let's write B plus C over here. In the old scenario, our producer surplus is this amount D, because it's the area above the supply curve, below the price of the producer, and to the left of the equilibrium quantity. So we can put a D right here. And then we can see that our total surplus is just B plus C plus D. And we can do the same thing for our after situation. Say, so, all right, after, here's our relevant price. So our new consumer surplus is everything above this line, below the new demand curve, and to the left of the new equilibrium quantity. So based on how we've labeled these things, the new consumer surplus is A plus B plus E. Put that over here. And my new producer surplus, again, same rules apply, is everything above the supply curve, below the relevant price to the producer, to the left of the equilibrium quantity. That's going to leave us with C, D, F, and G. So we can put that here. And we notice if we were to add this all up, we would just get A plus B plus C, plus D, plus E, plus F, plus G. Not surprisingly, everything that we labeled. So let's think about the changes. Notice that the overall change in total surplus is positive. It's a change of A plus E plus F plus G, because that's what we added in going from here to here. The change in producer surplus is also pretty straightforward because it's unambiguously positive. Because if we're going from a producer surplus of D to a producer surplus of C plus D plus F plus G, we've added C, F, and G. This consumer surplus is a little bit more complicated because here we've added A 
we've added E, but we've subtracted C. So the change is actually A plus E minus C. So all of a sudden now, our change in consumer surplus, we need to think more about whether this change is actually positive or negative. But here, you know, we can see unambiguously that the total surplus increased because this whole triangle here was bigger than this triangle here, which was the total surplus before the demand increase. It's also intuitively reasonable slash obvious that producer surplus would increase as a result of this change, because if you just look at the change in equilibrium here, what it implies is that producers are able to sell more and they're selling more at a higher price without any sort of corresponding cost increase. So if their costs haven't really changed and they're selling more at a higher price, obviously they're going to be better off. Their, con their producer surplus is going to increase. So we want to think about these consumers here because the consumers have a bit of a trade-off. The consumers are consuming more than they were before, and that's good. But they're also paying more than they were before. In terms of consumer surplus, that's bad. So we need to think intuitively about what's going on here to figure out whether overall consumer surplus is going to increase or decrease. In order to take a step back and think about the, the intuition behind this change and its effect on consumer surplus, I've just taken away our numbers here. And I'll actually take away this part of our dotted line too, just because it makes things a little bit easier to see. They're less cluttered. So let's think about this. Now, when we talked before about an increase in demand, we said that an increase in demand was a shift to the right of the demand curve, or shift and increase along the quantity dimension. However, we can also think about an increase in demand as a vertical shift up of our demand curve. And quantitatively, that vertical shift might not be the same size as this horizontal shift, but there are two different interpretations we can use for an increase in demand. And actually, that second interpretation, that vertical shift, turns out to be really helpful here. So we can think about this vertical distance between the two demand curves. I'm just going to think about that. Let's put it here that you'll notice that this is the vertical distance between the old demand curve and the new demand curve. And what this actually represents is the increase in willingness to pay for a given quantity of output. So whatever this amount is, this is how much more consumers are willing to pay for that quantity than they were before. So we can refer to this vertical distance as the increase in willingness to pay. And notice here that because this is a parallel shift, it doesn't always have to be, but because it is in this particular case, is how we chose to draw, draw it, let me do that in general, that this increase in willingness to pay is gonna be the same everywhere. So I wanna think about the increase in willingness to pay versus the increase in the price that the consumers are actually paying. And I put this vertical distance here because it actually helps us show the difference between those two amounts. Because if we look at the difference between the two equilibrium prices, it's just the vertical distance between these two dotted lines. So if we were to go over here, it's pretty clear that the increase in price the consumers are seeing is not as large as the increase in their evaluation of the item. So if we were to think about consumer surplus as you know, the willingness to pay minus the actual price, and the willingness to pay went up by more than the price went up, it has to be the case the consumer surplus is actually increasing. And we see here that yes, consumers are paying a higher price, but that higher price, that price increase was not as large as the increase in willingness to pay so any individual consumer that's consuming is sort of getting a higher consumer surplus margin than they were before. And there are more units transacted, so there are more units that are giving the consumers surplus.
So we actually can say the consumer surplus increases overall when we have a demand increase. And that would imply here that this area that we labeled before, A plus E minus C, is in fact going to be positive. 